Well, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Matthew Sorens only recently during a trip to Colorado when he came out and visited uh, Michelle Warren of the Evangelical Immigration Table. Matthew is the author of Welcoming the Stranger, Justice, Compassion, Truth, and the Immigration Debate, and is the U.S. Church Training Specialist for World Relief. Matt, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thank you. So in your book, you speak a bit about your personal journey. Uh, so how did you become interested in the immigration debate? Yeah, you know, I, I grew up in a context in uh, northeastern Wisconsin where if there were immigrants in my community, I was not aware of them. And so if I thought anything about immigration, it was what I saw on television or what I heard on the radio or what I saw, you know, in emails forwarded to me. And it wasn't necessarily a very positive perspective. Um, and then I moved down to the Chicago area. I went to college at Wheaton College, um, which is where I still, uh, I still live in Wheaton, Illinois. Um, and I started to notice that there were a lot of immigrants around me. But I don't think that I thought much of them. Um, I guess kind of they were sort of in the background. And then uh, I went... During college, I went and I spent the summer in Costa Rica um, with like a short-term missions project, where basically my job was to play soccer with kids and to you know try to stumble through broken Spanish to lead Bible studies. And um, I, I learned pretty quickly there in San Jose that most of the people I was I was working with were actually Nicaraguan immigrants to Costa Rica or their children. And I also it did not take me very long to realize that a lot of Costa Ricans don't like Nicaraguans very much. Um, they say things like they cause all the crime in, in Costa Rica and they bring disease and they're stealing jobs or they're lazy, which I never knew exactly how, quite how to put those two pieces together. Um, but, you know, it, it didn't really fit with my own experience. I got to know some of these Nicaraguan families um, who, you know, weren't perfect, but uh, were mostly really nice families who were part of the local church and were working incredibly hard to support their families. And at one point I asked one of my Nicaraguan friends, in San Jose, I, you know, so why would you come here? Why would you leave behind your, you know, everything you have in Nicaragua to come to this country where they don't treat you very well? And somebody told me, you know, Mateo, here we've got food on our plates and we can, you know, we can, I can support my, my elderly parents back in Nicaragua and that's all I can ask for. And I, that really struck me, especially as I came back to the Chicago area and I started to notice more of the, the immigrants in the Chicago area. And I began to wonder if maybe their stories were not that different than my friends in Nicaragua. So uh, when I finished college, I moved into a neighborhood where most of my neighbors are immigrants. So we've got more than 20 different countries of nationality just in my apartment complex, um, many of them with legal status, some of them without. And that, for me, really forced me to wrestle with some tough questions. What you know, I know that I'm supposed to love my neighbor, and I know that when Jesus says that, he means more than the person who lives just right next to you. But in my case, literally my next door neighbor was a family from Mexico, or at least a mother was from Mexico, um, who has been here about 20 years, and I eventually I realized was here unlawfully. And I re just really began to wrestle with that personally. What does it mean to love my neighbor, but we're also supposed to follow the law, and how, how do I put those things together? So that, that was kind of the beginning of my personal journey, I and mean, that coincided with starting to work at World Relief, where... I became a legal counselor and really got to understand how our immigration laws work and how they don't work. Um, so that's kind of how I get into this discussion on immigration. Well, let's, let's, let's follow up on that, Tech. You said you've done a lot of work with undocumented immigrants, so let me ask you a tough question. Why don't they just come the legal way? That's, you know, that was definitely my perspective when I started thinking about this issue as well. Why don't they just come the legal way or come the legal way that, the way that my ancestors did? Um, and I used to say that, and then I decided at a certain point I should see if that was true. So I looked it up, and my ancestors actually did come here lawfully to the United States. They came from Holland in the 1850s. And the reason they came lawfully was, at least in part, because in the 1850s there was no way to come illegally, because we had no federal immigration law. Um, you, you got on a boat and you showed up, which is not to say it was easy, but it was always legal. Uh, but that obviously has changed. We've dramatically restricted our immigration laws over the years, um, starting in about 1882 with the Chinese Exclusion Act, and then incrementally with a big shift in the 1920s that made it very, very difficult to migrate lawfully to the United States, especially if you were not Northern or Western European. And then we shifted the laws again in 1965, which is where we get the basis for our current, basically the backbone of our current immigration laws. Uh, under our current law, there are basically four ways that you might get a green card, which means to be a lawful permanent resident of the United States. So when we tell people to wait their turn in line, there's actually more than one line, um, and these, but there's four basic lines you can stand in. One is if you are what's considered a family-based immigrant. So there's at least 226,000 
immigrant visas available per year for family-sponsored immigrants. That means I'm a U.S. citizen. I file a petition for my spouse or my child, uh, my parent or my sibling. Or if you're a lawful permanent resident, you've got your green card, you can file a petition for your, your spouse or your parent. I'm sorry, not for your parent, your spouse or your child. Um, so sometimes that system works fairly well. Like, for example, my sister-in-law is an immigrant from Chile. She met my brother in graduate school. She was on a valid student visa. They fell in love. They got married. And, you know, as their wedding present, I filled out their green card application. You know, six months to a year and about $1,500 to $2,000, and it all works out okay. But that's kind of the best case scenario. It's a lot harder if you're married to a lawful permanent resident. A friend of mine here in the Chicago area is a pastor. He came from El Salvador, came legally, went through all the right process, and as soon as he got here, he filed for his wife and kids back in El Salvador. And it took him five years, more than five years, for them to come lawfully. And that's just the normal processing time for that relationship. Mm-hmm. The worst case scenario is if you are a sibling of a U.S. citizen and you're in the Philippines. Right now, they're processing cases from the 1980s. So it gives you a sense of how long the backlogs are. But that's the, that's the family line. But a lot of people don't have a family member who is a United States citizen or a lawful resident. So the next possibility would be employment-based immigration. Under our laws, we have at least 140,000 immigrant visas available each year for employer-sponsored immigrants. That means you have an employer in the U.S. who has advertised a job and and cannot find a qualified U.S. citizen um, or lawful permanent resident to do it. They can then, in, in some cases, sponsor an immigrant to come in from another country. The trick with that uh, element of law is that the vast majority of those visas go to, towards uh, immigrant workers who are considered highly skilled. So that means they have a master's degree, basically, or some unique uh, or exceptional ability. But there's only 5,000 visas available per year, uh, immigrant visas available per year, that could possibly go to someone who's not considered highly skilled. So, for example, if you're coming to do agricultural work or to clean hotel rooms or to work in the kitchen of a restaurant, those are not considered highly skilled jobs. And you're competing with all those highly skilled workers as well for 5,000 visas a year. Hmm. Then into context, a century ago, when at the height of the of Ellis Island, we had 5,000 uh, immigrants coming in through Ellis Island in an average day. And most of those, if we had the same system then that we have now, would have been considered you know, unskilled or low-skilled. Hmm. The third of the four possibilities to come lawfully to this country is something called the diversity visa lottery. So that's an online lottery. You enter by the State Department website. It's free. Um, the odds of winning last year were about 1 in 300. So, you know, better than one of those scratch-off games at the gas station, but still not very good. Not very good. And the other element of the diversity visa lottery is you have to have at least a high school education or two years of professional experience. So that excludes a lot of the world. And you can't be from Mexico or from India or China or the Philippines, South Korea, or any of the other countries that already send the most and then the last possibility is if you are if you are designated as a refugee, which under our laws is someone who is fleeing persecution, specifically on account of their race, their religion, their political opinion, their national origin, or their social group. Uh, but the important thing to understand about refugee status, and in my world relief, that's actually the primary group of immigrants that we work with, is people who have fled persecution off on account of their, their faith. Um, in my neighborhood, we have a lot of Karen Burmese refugees who are very strong Christians who are persecuted by their government because of their faith and for their ethnicity. Um, so those are examples of refugees. But it's important to know that if you are fleeing poverty, that does not make you a refugee. Uh, or if you are fleeing a natural disaster, like an earthquake or a tsunami, that's not persecution. Even if you're fleeing violence, but you can't prove that the violence was directed against you because of your race, your religion, or one of those reasons, you're not a refugee. And then even if you legitimately are a refugee, you fled your country because of persecution for one of those particular enumerated grounds, uh, but you actually settles less than one half of 1% of the world's refugees in a given year. So it doesn't mean you get a free pass to come to the United States. If you're a refugee and you happen to be rather lucky, then you're coming to the U.S. Um, and I go through those four paths because I think it's important. We'll often tell people, well, just come the legal way. Go wait your turn in line. But the reality is there's a lot of people who don't fit into any one of those lines. Um, who don't have a family member, who are not highly skilled, who you know aren't very fortunate to win a lottery or just are from the wrong country and they can't even apply in the first place, mm-hmm. who may be fleeing poverty, but they're not fleeing persecution. And that's a lot of my neighbors um, 
who fit into those categories. There was no way for them to come legally in the first place. It doesn't matter if they wait 10 years. It doesn't matter if they wait 50 years. It doesn't matter how much money they try to pay. And on one level, I think that's, you know, that might just be tough. I'm not suggesting that the U.S. can take all the world's immigrants. But the reality is that we have a lot of jobs in this country, a lot more than those 5,000 low-skilled visas available each year allow. And as a result, people have come in unlawfully, either overstaying a visa or uh, entering across the southern border unlawfully. And for the most part, our government has had a policy of select enforcement because most people realize that those people are actually doing jobs and benefiting the U.S. economy. There's not a willingness to get rid of them all. But there also hasn't been a willingness to figure out how do we adjust our visa system so that there is a way for people to come in lawfully in ways that meet the needs of the U.S. labor market. Well, before we get into those details, I want to, your, your faith has influenced your perspective on this tremendously. So in what way, how does, what does the Bible have to say about this topic of immigration? Yeah, you know, when I started wrestling with this personally, I thought maybe there might be a Bible verse or two that might guide my thinking on this. And I'm embarrassed to say that because that was definitely my attitude. But I, I really opened up the scriptures again, and I read uh, Christians at the Border, a book by Danny Carroll, who's there at Denver Seminary, and I think um, he'll be with us in a few weeks. Uh, but I, I just really had my eyes open to the many, many, many things that the Bible says on this topic of immigration. Um, the Hebrew word for an immigrant uh, appears 92 times just in the Old Testament. That's where we get that term, G92. And somehow I'd missed that. You know, I grew up in a really wonderful church. I had been taught to read my Bible, you know, I think by about third grade, I'd read through the whole thing and kept reading it and went to Christian college and took Old Testament, New Testament. And, you know, I thought of myself as a fairly biblically literate person. But somehow I miss all that the Bible says about immigration, and I think that's pretty typical. I mean, if you, one of the things I do when I speak sometimes, I'll ask, people, I'll ask people, so how many of you have ever heard a sermon on immigration? And very few hands go up. How many of you have ever done a small group study on immigration? You know, how many of you memorized some Bible verses and some hands go up? How many of those have to do with immigration? All the hands go down. And that's been my experience. It's also consistent with um, the data from the Pew Research Center, which says that only 16% of white evangelicals have ever heard about immigration from their pastor. And probably as a result, only 12% of white evangelicals say that they think about the topic of immigration primarily from the perspective of their Christian faith. Hmm. To me, that's that's a scandal, because we're, as evangelical Christians, we say that the scriptures are authority for all of us. Um, so, you know, I won't take you through all of what the scriptures say, because we don't have a ton of time, and there's a ton there, but there's a number of consistent themes that we find in the Bible. For one, God repeatedly mentions the, the immigrant or the alien or the sojourner, depending upon your Bible translation, along with the fatherless and the widow, as people who are of special concern to God, whom, whose, whose rights God is interested in protecting. Um, the Israelites are commanded multiple times to remember their own history as an immigrant people. God says, remember that you were aliens in Egypt, and to let that experience inform how they treat the immigrants who come after them. And that's an idea that I would hope would resonate with American Christians, because most of us, if you're not completely Native American, we have immigrant histories of our own. And we've often forgot how hard it was for our ancestors. Um, and then you have the idea of hospitality, which is, you know, I grew up with the idea that hospitality was something to do with, like, Martha Stewart or the Food Network, um, like, you know, having your friends over for dinner. But actually, hospitality is more than having your friends over for dinner, because Hospitality in the Greek is philozenia, it's the love of strangers, uh, which is great if you love your friends, but Jesus actually says in the Gospels at one point, everybody loves their friends. What is uniquely Christian is to welcome and to love those who are beyond your friends, who are strangers to you, even to love your enemies, Jesus says. And, and I think that's, you know, as we do so, we're promised that, um, it says in Hebrews 13, that by welcoming a stranger, some people have entertained angels without realizing. And that brings up this idea that maybe... These group of people who many in our society see as a threat, as something to be afraid of, are actually a blessing. And my real hope is, as, as we look at this biblically, is that we see a missional opportunity. Um, it is an economic opportunity as well, and we can talk about that. But most importantly for the church, you know, we're told to go and make disciples of all nations, Matthew 28. Well, God has brought the nations to our community. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't send people out, but most of us are not going to go to a different country. But we need to have the eyes to see what God is doing in our own communities and to respond to that missional opportunity. And also recognizing that it's a missional opportunity in multiple directions because many of the people who come into this country bring a vibrant Christian faith with them. And they are reinvigorating churches that you know, need some new life. Um, 
they're also sharing the gospel with both the people in their own ethnic groups and with people beyond their ethnic groups. And it's fun for me to see how God is working through the movement of people. Um, my hope is that we can see that biblical perspective, which I think suggests to us that immigration is an opportunity, and not be fixated on some of the things we see as threats. One last question. So what can local churches do then to welcome the stranger? How do you counsel churches to respond to this issue? Yeah, we've used an acronym at World Relief that we call, uh, it's PLEASE. So P-L-E-A-S-E. -E. The P is for prayer, um, which, you know, we're told to pray without ceasing. Hopefully that's obvious. But I think most of us haven't spent a lot of time praying for the immigrants in our community. So that'd be where we would ask people to start. Um, and then listening both to... First and foremost, what God's Word says, to what Scripture says, and also to the immigrants in our community, and especially in our local churches. Um, you know, hearing their stories has definitely affected the way that I think about this topic. Hmm. But first and foremost, grounding ourselves in God's Word. Um, we, we've launched something uh, nationally, and I know it's a lot of churches in Colorado are doing it, called the I Was a Stranger Challenge, where we've got a bookmark that lists 40 Bible verses related to the topic of immigration. And our challenge has been... Whatever you think about immigration, wherever you land on some of the policy questions, would you take 40 days and one, and just read one simple verse each day for 40 days? And we're not going to tell you how to interpret it. We're not going to tell you even which translation to use. But I would hope as Christians that we can agree that our, our thinking about this topic should be counted in God's Word. Um, so that's the L is for listening. The E is for education, which is, as you get this, as I get this, how can we help other people understand? How can we help disciple others to think about this in a distinctly biblical way, whether that's a small group study or, um, you know, a, a sermon on a Sunday or a conference like what we're going to be doing in a few weeks. The A is for advocacy, which is basically, um, it's what it says to do in Proverbs 31a, it's to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Hmm. Now, I want to be a little careful with that verse because I just told you to listen to immigrants, so clearly immigrants can speak for themselves. But on a, on a political level, uh, if you're not a citizen, you can't vote. And if you cannot vote, most politicians don't care very much what you think. But I can vote, and I can call my congressperson. And so I think I, I have the responsibility to become informed about the public policy options, to look at them from a Christian perspective, and then to use my voice to reach out to my legislators and let them know what I think. Um, the S is for service. There's a lot of needs in the immigrant community, very tangible human needs. Uh, the very most basic of which is just friendship. That people come here, many of them don't know anybody, and to be welcomed into somebody's home, to have you know, by someone who will be patient with your lack of you know, if you're still learning the language, to have somebody explain how to you know use the bus or how to get your kids enrolled in, in school is incredibly um, important, and a, and that leads right into the the last piece, which is the E, which is evangelism. We have the opportunity to share the hope of the gospel. Again, many of the people who come in already know Jesus in a vibrant way, but some of them don't. Some of them come with a, a nominal faith. Some of them come from entirely unreached people groups. And that's an opportunity that I think God has placed right at our doorstep, that we can, you know, can join God in what he's doing already. And I, my fear is that if, we, if we're not looking at this topic from a biblical perspective, if we're letting a political or an economic narrative frame our, our thinking, we might miss out on that, that missional opportunity.